from Messiah to messenger of death. Once crowned the cult's Prince of the Apocalypse, now the Prince of Vengeance and Justice. Ricky Rodriguez's life was plagued with sexual abuse, brainwashing, and a childhood ruled by authoritarian systems. Deprived of a childhood, robbed of his innocence, and unwillingly indoctrinated into a cult that focused on free love and encouraged adult-child sexual relationships. This is the story of Ricky Rodriguez, the prophesized prince of the apocalypse. Welcome to another episode of the Cabinet of Dr. Mystery. I'm your host, Dr. Mystery. I tried to create living zombies. Reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. All I gotta do is relax and they'll take me to their death. Last chance to evacuate Earth before it is recycled. This is a wicked, wicked world. We are all evil in some form or another. We have a dead God who's been dead and quiet and silent for 2,000 years now, according to these fundamentalist evangelicals who only accept just the Bible alone and don't believe that Jesus has ever said anything since then. Isn't that silly? Don't you think that's rather crazy? Huh? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to worship a God that's dead, would you? No. Don't you want to worship a God that's alive mm -hmm. and who talks and speaks to us today? Yeah. And talks to his prophets and to his children mm -hmm. and to your daddy? Do you like to hear God speak through your daddy? You've heard him lots of times, haven't you? You read it in the letters and the comics and the prophecies, right? Yeah. Aren't you glad that God still speaks today? Yes. Yeah, to his prophets today? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You're a little prophet too. He speaks through you. And he's getting to be more of a man every day and going to be a big, strong prophet for Jesus someday. Like Daddy. Only better. He's going to be a young teenager, and that's a good prophet for young people. Well, hey everyone. This is Rick, and I'm making this video, um, well, for many reasons, I guess. Uh, I suppose the main reason is that I want there to be some record of the way I feel, um, my ideas, just who I was, really. Uh, I've met, got to know um, some ex-members here and there, some more than others. Uh, but I wanted to explain some of the things that I've been doing and thinking and some of the frustrations that I've had. Anyway, I don't know, I just, I guess it's my uh, sort of my last grasp at uh, immortality. I know that I'm not immortal and I know that this video is not going to make me so. But, At the same time, I want to, um, I want people to know that even though um, some of the things that I'm going to try to do are rather shocking and um, maybe not right in a lot of people's books, I want to explain some of the reasons behind them. So anyway. just loading some of my mags here. Hope you guys don't mind if I do that while I talk. Welcome, Mysterians, to the final episode in our Children of God series. It's been a long road. We've discussed a lot. And, uh, you know, if you're just joining us, if you haven't listened to the last few episodes on our Children of God series, I would highly recommend going back and giving those a listen before, before we get into this stuff here. Before we get into Ricky and the story of David Ito, it's important that you know the history and the background of David Berg and the Children of God cult. So if you haven't checked out our other episodes in the Children of God series, I would at least recommend that you check out episode 1 and 2 before you start this. In episode 12, 
We talked a bit about how Ricky Rodriguez was Karen's son, who was fathered by a man that Karen was flirty fishing with. Ricky's father was Carlos. He was a waiter in the Bel Air Hotel in Tenerife, where Berg and Zerbi were staying. Karen was flirty fishing. She was practicing flirty fishing. And, and uh, you know, in earlier episodes, we talked about how earlier on, Karen and only like two or three other women were uh, involved in flirty fishing. And it was kind of just a practice that was only done with Berg's wives or the, the elite female members of the group. And eventually that flirty fishing expanded. And, you know, if you want to learn more about flirty fishing, episode 12 and episode 13. Ricky Rodriguez was born as David Moses Zerby. He later legally changed his name to Richard Peter Smith. Throughout David and Maria's writing, they often speak about how Ricky is a chosen messiah. Ricky is a divine prince who will lead the cult through David's end time. We covered his apocalyptic prophecies in the first two episodes of our series again, so if you want to learn more about flirty fishing and David Berg and the apocalypse, you should check out those episodes. And as we we go throughout this episode, uh, there will definitely be callbacks, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about, you know, explaining things that I've already explained in the series. So if there's something that needs more context, I'll simply just say it's in episode 12 or it's in part 3 or whatever. Because of his status in the cult, Ricky's childhood was highly publicized and these publications were used as a model for parents to raise their children within the family. So Ricky's youth was spent in a highly controlled environment, frequented with discipline, indoctrination, and sexual initiation from adult cult members. A little bit later on, we'll discuss teen training, and we'll discuss how that affected Ricky, and you know, we'll, we'll just touch on a few things that Ricky was required to do in teen training as he was trained and raised to be David Berg's successor, as he was supposed to take over and be the new messiah and the new leader of the cult. So he had a lot of pressure on his shoulders that he was supposed to be the Messiah, the Chosen One. And throughout the cult, and and as we go throughout this episode, we'll see that, you know, all that weight was put on Ricky's shoulders from the second that he was born. So Ricky later stated that he and other children in the royal family were never allowed to be just children, that they always had to perform and demonstrate their supposed superiority, because he's the Chosen Prince, he's the Messiah. So he needs to be held to different standards, held above everybody else in the cult. So like I said, from the, like from the minute that he was born, he isn't a child anymore. He's the new chosen Messiah. He is Jesus Christ reincarnated, basically. Now throughout Ricky's life, he relocated frequently with Berg and Zerbi, and usually Berg was fleeing the country due to flirty fishing or child sexual abuse or other controversial practices that had got him into hot water with the law. And in our last episode, we discussed how, I mean, throughout this whole series, we've discussed how Berg uh, lives his life in seclusion for the majority of the cult. In our last episode, we really touched on how David Berg and the close-knit royal family and, and his, his secret group that he had with select uh, chosen followers, they were held to secrecy. And in the last episode, we see that multiple times when David Berg is seen somewhere, they flee right away. And it's because, you know, he's always in trouble with the law because of his preaching and his practices. From 1977 to late 1987, Ricky lived in Spain, Switzerland, France, and the Philippines. And for a period of time, he also spent time in Estoril. Portugal, Sri Lanka, and Singapore. Regardless of where Ricky was or where he was moving or where they were relocating to, the abuse that he experienced followed him. Now, we've briefly touched on the story of David Ito in past episodes. The book of David Ito was a documentation of the cult's messiah, David Ito, also known as Ricky Rodriguez, 
but it served as a guide on how to raise your children within the cult. And the book was mainly written by Sarah Stevenson Kelly. Of course, this being the children of God, the book, like I said, also details explicit sexual grooming that Sarah and others like her subjected Ricky and Davida to. And we'll talk about Davida in a minute here. Other names that Sarah has used are Priscilla. Oh, wait. Prissa? The fuck? Okay, Priscilla is a nice name. Prissa? I don't know. That sounds like Prius and Pussy. I don't know. Prissa. Sounds like Prius and Pussy. Does, does it not? A, a Pussy Prius. <laughs> she also went by Kelly. Sarah Davidito. Sarah Stevens. Sarah Stevenson. And finally, Sharon. So she, you know, like a lot of people in this cult, they all have pseudonyms or they have biblical names that they use in place of their real names. So Sarah was born May 14th, 1950. I'm not entirely sure where she was born. I tried to look into that, but it doesn't matter. She's an asshole. We don't like her. It doesn't matter where she was born. No matter where she's born, it doesn't eradicate the fact that she is a child sexual predator. Throughout other episodes, I'm going to keep saying that. I apologize, but, you know, it's necessary because I'm not going to give context for everything. Throughout other episodes, I've read Mo letters and other various documentation of explicit sexual practices and different written scriptures that David wrote about sexual practices. To be honest with you, I am getting a little tired of reading all of this disgusting material, so I'm just going to discuss the book instead of, you know, reading a lot of passages from it and, and giving you straight up examples. I'm just going to tell you about it. That being said, I will pull a couple passages from it, but I'm not going to use it. You know, I'm not going to recite a lot of it out to you because it's just nonsense and it's just garbage. The majority of people hide their, their you know, disgusting, depraved acts. Like, you don't see a serial killer. I mean, well, okay. I was going to say you don't see a serial killer writing books on how to be serial killers, but you actually do. And we'll definitely talk about this in the future, but there are several serial killers who have written books about the crimes that they have committed. And those cri- the, the books have been used as evidence. The book that I'm thinking of currently right now is Amok. A-M-O-K. I can't remember the author because... Um, you know, he's just a murderer and he's in prison now, but you know, that sort of idea about someone writing about the, um, you know, messed up, controversial, disgusting, violent, uh, acts that they're committing, it just baffles me. You're really just putting down evidence of what you did. And, you know, I should say that the Family International, I'm not sure if it was before or after Berg's death, but they took the book and they purged it. So they took all the images that were controversial. They took all the sexual, you know, explicit sexual passages and, and images. And uh, they basically burned the book. They took everything that they thought was appropriate for child rearing in terms of raising the child in the cult, not in a sexual way. And they got rid of all the sexual content and they re-released the book. And, you know, I imagine it was before... Ricky, you know, before all the events happened that we're going to discuss in this episode. But the fact that they did that purge just shows that they know that something's wrong. Even you could even say that the, you know, people heard about this and they were upset and it was almost required of them to get rid of this book. But, you know, just the fact that they even purged it and cleaned it up means that they knew that something was wrong. In the story of David Ito, There are instances of a 13-month-old Ricky unknowingly fondling a nude nanny's breasts. So as she hung over the changing table, right, she was changing him and her breasts were hanging down. And as it says in the book, Ricky reached up and tried to turn each, quote, knob. uh, So he was fondling her breasts. And that's 13 months old. There's also accounts of him both witnessing and initiating sexual contact with adults. On one occurrence, he imitated the sexual activity that he had witnessed frequently with a three-month-old, which I believe was Davida. 
There's also accounts of Ricky being exposed to pornography, having sexual intercourse with his mother, or taking nude photos with her, and being masturbated or orally copulated by multiple nannies. So we briefly talked about Sarah Kelly just a minute ago. And as I said, she was one of the main authors of the story of David Ito. But Sarah was also involved in the psychological and physical torture that David's granddaughter, Mary Berg, went through. In episode 15, we discussed Mary and the encounters that Juliana, Christina, and Celeste had with her at the Jumbo compound. Previously, in episode 13, we really went into detail about all the horrors that Mary was subjected to. So if you're just joining us, I would highly recommend that episode in particular, because Mary had a devastatingly challenging childhood. In the first couple episodes, I said that I was going to get to this story about Ricky Rodriguez and the story of David Ito, but the reason that I pushed it back was because I wanted to tell you the story of all these families and all these young men and women who were in the cult who were abused. A lot of them have gone on to do amazing things. And unfortunately, a significant chunk of them have also committed suicide or died via drug overdose, etc. So throughout the series, that's one of the you know, main things that I wanted to touch on is you know, David Berg and Karen Zerbe, how the Children of God and the Family International, how they twisted and contorted God's word and written scripture, and they devoured anyone who was in their path. I really wanted to highlight how these children were affected and and the things that the cult really did to them. On multiple occasions, Sarah Kelly wrote how she performed sexual acts with or around Ricky, and on one occasion, she wrote, quote, As soon as I got into bed, he jumped on me and said, Sarah, love me. He specifically asked for several swigs of wine, and he got happy real quick, so we really had a good time. Alfred, Tim, and Mommy were outside the door listening to him. Sarah, now kiss it, he said. And then he began to laugh and laugh. Oh, it flopped on your nose. Clearly, this isn't normal behavior. But if this is all you know, then this is normal to you. Ricky has no idea of anything else besides, you know, this highly sexualized energy and, and, and these highly sexualized acts that these people are performing with or around or, or to children, you know, him laughing and that sort of thing, it, you know, it shows that he's clearly too young to understand what sex really is. Obviously, when two consenting adults have sex, there's laughter and there's joy, but not in this kind of context. So you're, you're giving a three-year-old wine, and you're kissing his dick. It's fucking whack. He's a three-year-old boy at this point. Sarah also encouraged Ricky to perform sex acts with her daughter, Davida, who we mentioned before. We briefly talked about Davida in the past, but unfortunately, she's just one in a long line of women and young girls to be abused by the men and women in the cult. Davida and Ricky were meant to rule together. They were not only encouraged to have sex with each other, even though they were considered brother and sister, but David Berg married Davida when she was five years old. Rick and Davida were frequently in the story of David Ito. Again, the author of the book, Sarah Kelly, was Davida's mother. So Davida's own mother is giving her up for sex with her half-brother and her father. Davida states that both her and Rick would be required to spend nights with David and Maria. And Davida recalls one particular night, as they had love-up time with their parents. She was masturbating David while Ricky and Karen engaged in full penetrative sex. The story of David Ito was 762 pages long and included pictures of Ricky with naked women and girls, occasionally during group orgies. So this incestuous behavior, we've discussed it in previous episodes. And, you know, if we go back to the first episode, David Berg had 
begun this incestuous behavior since he was a kid, right? He said that he he had sex with one of his cousins. He would, you know, molest his daughters. You know, in the first or second episode, we discussed how he would fondle his young daughters to get them to, quote, calm down to go to sleep. So this was all normal behavior to him, right? And that's kind of what I wanted to express and what I wanted to stress with these episodes is that from the beginning, right from the beginning, this guy had been practicing incestuous behavior and child sexual abuse practices. And throughout the cult's history, he indoctrinates this and he says that this is normal behavior. In fact, he says it's more than normal. When we look at God's law of love, he says that it's more than normal behavior. It's expressing your love to your children. It's showing how much you love them. I don't give a fuck how much you love me. Don't touch my dick. One of the several nannies that would frequently abuse him appeared in the book. Her name was Sue Cowton. Sue also had a range of pseudonyms. She was also known as Cedar, Trust, and Hope. In 1993, Sue legally changed her name to Angela Marilyn Smith. Sue was born in Washington, D.C. and raised in Virginia. In a 2005 SF Gate article, they state that Sue's age was 51. So that would have her born around 1954. Berg's letters show that from the mid-70s until the mid-80s, Sue was his lover, she was a leader in flirty fishing, and she was trusted for only the most dangerous missions. She was also the royal family's child care worker, as well as Karen Zerbe's personal assistant and secretary. So throughout these writings that Berg has about Sue and her relationship with the family, the royal family, he says that, according to David and Maria, that they could not live without Sue, that Sue was Zerbe's right-hand woman. She, she was a part of the royal family. She was in this, this circle that they had where it was only like secret, you know, secretive and it was only exclusive members of the group that had been there for a long time that had displayed or showed signs that they would be loyal to the cult. And Sue was a part of that inner circle. In one excerpt of the story of David Ito, we see pictures of Sue undoing Ricky's pants with the caption below, quote, undressing for Sue. So Sue had just as much of a a part in Ricky's abuse that, you know, as anyone did. And as we go in, you know, further in this episode, we'll see exactly what Ricky thought of her and the abuse that she, you know, put him through. From our earlier episodes, again, dipping back into the archives here, the practice of adult-child sexual relationships was banned by Berg in 1986. So we saw in previous episodes that Berg had wrote this letter that said, we do not encourage, condone, we we do not accept any child sexual abuse. This letter banning child sexual abuse, it was followed by a letter written by Karen, almost contradicting that entire statement, saying that the practice of child sexual assault should be continued as long as it's done in a loving way. She states that it was simply something to hide from systemites. So, again, going back into the the law of love, the law of love is that, you know, if you're doing anything lovingly, as long as you're acting in good faith and you're acting in a loving manner, then regardless of what you're doing, it's not wrong. So that's something that I kind of drilled into you as we go along in these episodes is that they they use this law of love. I You know, I'm acting out of love. I'm touching his pee-pee because I love him. So they use this law of love to get away with anything, really. Now, when we're talking about the practice of, you know, pedophilia and child sexual assault within the cult, Celeste, Christina, and Juliana, whom we spoke of in great detail in our previous episode, they can attest to the fact that this practice didn't stop after that initial letter from Berg. In late 1987 to late 1988, Ricky would have been about 12 or 13 at the time, the royal family resided in Tokyo, Japan, 
as well as Tataima, Chiba. In our last episode, we discussed the Tataima compound, the massive pyramid structure, and the 21st century international school, which was also known within the cult as the Heavenly City School. Ricky attended the HSC while the royal family was living in the area. From late 1988 to mid-1993, both Berg and Zerbe resided in Canada, just outside of Vancouver, B.C. In May of 1993, Berg and Zerbe were forced to flee Canada because of their continued illegal attempts to obtain Canadian passports, and they relocated to Portugal near Lisboa. The love prophet David Berg died of undisclosed causes in 1994 and was buried in Costa de Caparica, Portugal. After his death, Karen Zerbe, a.k.a. Queen Mama Maria, she takes over the cult. After spending a year in Russia, Ricky met his first wife, Alicia Monumel, in Russia. Ricky went to Russia. He met Alicia, uh, I believe, that they got married in Russia, but I'm not 100% sure. Now, when Ricky took Elysia back to the compound and he was living with his mother, wife swapping was still a normal practice. This upset both Elysia and Ricky, as they were disgusted that they had to sleep with other people. So after a year in Russia, and another three years at his mother's secret leadership compound in Portugal, Ricky and Elysia decided to leave the family. Ricky spent a year traveling throughout California, Venezuela, and England, and he arranged to meet up with Alicia after she was done wherever she was visiting. I believe she was in Europe. And Ricky ended up selling a car so that he and Alicia could be reunited again. After this year of separation, he tentatively decides to rejoin the cult. In 2001, Alicia and Ricky got married, They moved into a low-rent apartment, and Ricky took a job on a fishing boat in Alaska. According to Alicia, they struggled with finances and with experience in the outside world. Now, that's something that we see in a lot of our past episodes, that anybody who tries to leave the cult, you know, they, they don't have money, they don't have family really anymore. And they don't know anything about, like, they have no education, no money, no family, no anything. They just have the clothes on their back that they can take and leave. That's it. After finally leaving the cult, Ricky wrote a letter to his mother expressing why he and Alicia left. Quote, We cannot continue to condone or be party to what we feel is an abusive, manipulative organization that teaches false doctrine. You have devoured God's sheep, ruining people's lives by propagating false doctrines and advocating harmful practices in the name of God. And as far as I can see, you show no regret or remorse. You know, again, Ricky doesn't have a lot of education. He doesn't have a lot of money. But we know from this statement that Ricky is an intelligent person, that he is a well-formed, well-thought-out person. And dare I say that his statement is absolutely accurate. In 2002, writings of Ricky's began showing up where he expressed his anger at the cult's abuse of children. And a lot of these posts were showing up in Children of God forums or ex-family forums, that sort of thing. In this one post, Ricky wrote, quote, It gives me hope that one day their evil legacy will die with the family and it will be only a distant, or better yet, forgotten bad memory. So you see that Ricky left the cult, he's trying to move on with his life, even though he wrote this letter to his mother and he's writing all these forum posts, it seems like he's still in good spirits and that he's hopeful that the family will end and the the end of the cult will be soon. Now in the fall of 2004, Ricky relocated to Tucson, Arizona after news reached him that Karen had visited her parents in a retirement home in the city. While he was in the city, he reached out to his aunt, Rosemary Canspados. I, I watched this documentary about Ricky, and I believe it's called Cult Killer. And in the documentary, Ricky meets with his aunt, Rosemary, and the interviewer asks, 
What did it feel like to be stuck in the middle between your sister and your nephew? You're, you're kind of caught in the middle of this, and she interrupted him, and she said, No, I wasn't caught in the middle of this. Ricky is my nephew. He never had a childhood. He was abused systemically, and he came out of it a, a well-thinking, logical, you know, good-hearted man, and he's my nephew. I'm going to help him no matter what. And his uncle basically said the same thing. So he doesn't really have family, but at this point, he's fortunate enough to meet up with his mother's sister, with Karen's sister, and, uh, you know, they give him a welcome, a, a, you know, a nice warm welcome. We'll talk about this in a minute here, but from 2002 to 2004, Ricky was plagued with people, you know, ex-members from the cult asking him, you know, begging him to do something, to stand up for the children that are still in the cult and do something to seek justice for the wrongdoings that other children like him had experienced. After separating from his wife and moving to Tucson, Arizona in 2004, Ricky began leaving more cryptic messages on forums and message boards dedicated to ex-children of God, ex-family members. In one post from August, he expressed hope at being able to move on with his life after his previous postings on the message board. Then he stated, I know now that that will never happen. I can't run away from my past, and no matter how long how much longer I live, the first 25 years of my life will always haunt me. According to his friend Celeste Jones, who we mentioned in episode 16, quote, he was very upset and thought there was no justice. Alicia, his wife, or ex-wife at this point, she stated fellow cult members pressured Ricky to take a stand against the cult. She also said that he felt that it wasn't fair that he got a second chance at life where others were abused, they did not. So, you know, the, his whole life, he's had this whole, um, this whole Messiah complex, right? He's been indoctrinated to believe that he was the chosen one. And, you know, he's always had that leadership role. He's always had these, you know, that, that heavy weight on his shoulders. And, now that's really starting to show that he can't shake that feeling, that he should be leading something, that he should be doing something. And all these people are turning to him and asking for, you know, like, that's the Messiah. This is the chosen one. And even if you're out of the cult and you don't believe what's happening, you know, in terms of their, their scripture and, and their practices, you know, we still see that he uses words like systemite and we still see that he has that Messiah complex, right? And it's not, it's not that Ricky thinks that he's above everybody else in that sense of the word, right? He just has been indoctrinated and instilled with this sense of leadership, with this leadership role, and that follows him out of the cult as well. Don Latin, the author of Jesus Freaks, was quoted as saying, Ricky took justice into his own hands because most of the abuse was like 20 years ago, so the statute of limitations has expired. Most of it happened outside of the U.S., so it's very difficult to prosecute. As we've gone through this series, we see repeatedly that when children are either born or, you know, um, indoctrinated into the cult, that these children are shuffled around, that they're moved around to different communes, different compounds, and different countries. And the reason that they do that is, you know, they say that the family itself is the family. So your children are not your children. Other people's children are your children as well, right? And your children are not just yours, they're everybody else's. So the idea is that when they do this, when they take the children out away from their parents, they are put into these positions where the only people they can go to for help are the abusers themselves. Their guardians themselves are abusing the children. So really, they're all alone. They have no one to help them. That's what we see repeatedly is that they move these children around and that's why they did it is because you can't really prosecute something in the U.S. or in Canada if it happens in a different country, right? It's difficult for you to do that. It's difficult to get extradition from another country, but it's even more difficult for you to have a court case about something that happened in a different country. While he's in Tucson, 
Ricky practices martial arts at a local gym. He joins a gun club, and he gets a job as an electrician. After four months of waiting, Ricky set up his brand new video camera and hit the record button. As the screen fades into focus, we see a young man with a dark complexion, his head shaved close to the scalp, wearing a maroon-colored muscle shirt. Sum 41 plays in the background as a low, electronic hum fills the apartment. As he sits on a wooden chair, a dimly lit lamp illuminates a round wooden table loaded with guns, clips, and rounds of ammunition. As he speaks, he loads his clips. This is Ricky's last confession. In the video, he states he had been contemplating suicide ever since being forced as a young adolescent to participate in teen training. In another forum post from 2002, he detailed how the teen training required him to have sex with different teenage women in the cult every day. I've compiled a few clips from Rick's video, and I'll play them momentarily. If you'd like to see the full video, please visit our YouTube page. I'll link it in the description below. In these clips that we're about to hear, we'll hear about his thoughts on the cult, his mother, David Berg, suicide, as well as his plans for justice. I should also remind you that Mary Berg is frequently referred to as Mene, which is who Rick is referring to here. He's a little life, you know? She's a little life. And you just fuck him over because you're a sick fucking pervert and you don't have anything better to do with your life than to fuck up your little kids. It's just so far beyond me, I just can't fucking imagine it. But yet it happened. It happened right before me. It happened to all of you. Thousands of us. Some worse than others. I had it good in many ways. I didn't get fucked in the ass. I was a guy, you know? A lot of you girls, psh, crap. I can't even compare my stories with yours. But that's not what this is about. We're not sitting here comparing, oh, you got it worse than I did. You got it more times than I did. Because it's not about that. There's so many other kinds of abuse that went on that to some of us were just as bad. Some of us, to some of us, it wasn't. And some of us didn't have it that bad. So I'm not going to sit here and say, oh yeah, I had it the worst. Or I didn't. Because it doesn't really matter. It should never have happened at all to anybody. That's the point. I've tried so many things. Trying to, uh, trying to somehow fit in, somehow to find, you know, a normal life. Now, everybody's gonna, everybody has said, who I've talked to about this, well, you know, yeah, yeah, everybody has their problems, everybody has a fucked up life. But those people who say that, you know, they had no clue as to what actually went on because they weren't part of the cult. These are just average systemites. As kids, we didn't always get along that well with me because she was older. She was better at playing the game than we were. We were just little fuckers who were trying to have fun, and, and she um, set the bar so high because they really did grade on the curve that, uh, that it made it tough for us. But, you know, none of us, none of us um, rejoiced when that happened to her. Nobody, nobody deserved that, especially not a kid that age. So, I watched every day new bruises on her, big fucking fat fucking bruises. And I started thinking to myself, holy fuck, you know, there's got to be a way. There's got to be a way how one person can stand up to a group of strong men. There's got to be some sort of equalizer. And I found that equalizer in edged weapons and training. So I was thinking, oh, that's pretty cool, you know, maybe I'll, uh, I'll, uh, you know, go rent a nice hotel. Nice hotel. You know, 
maybe penthouse. Um, run a nice fucking bath in the jacuzzi tub. Um, spend a night with a nice, nice hooker. I just thought it'd be cool because I've never been with a hooker before. And, uh, anyway, it's sort of like what Tom Likas says, you know. Uh, you're going to pay for sex anyway, one way or another. <laughs> you might as well pay somebody who knows what the fuck they're doing. So anyway, that was sort of my dream. And at the end, you know, have some beers. Get out my scalpel and a nice hot jacuzzi tub. Just to end it. Yeah, I'm sort of quitting right now, but in a way I'm not. Because I'm not doing it the way I want to do it. I'm trying to do something lasting. Something that if God forbid in the next life I, it does go on, um, that I can look back on this if I'm able to and, and know that, okay, maybe I didn't technically do the right thing, but I tried to do something to help. I didn't just fade away. I didn't just turn tail and run and let those fuckers win that I did what I could to make a difference. And I don't really know how far I'm going to get. I'm starting to think now that it's not going to be that far. And that's going to suck ass. I might not I'll get one person, that's for sure. My source for the information. Um, the goal is to bring down those sick fuckers Mama and Peter. My own mother. What an evil little cunt. God damn. How can you do that to kids? How can you do that to kids and sleep at night? I don't fucking know. Anyway, that's my goal. Alright. Okay, well, keep, keep fighting, keep the faith, and all that other stuff. And someday, in some way, some of us are going to be around to see those fuckers burn. Literally or figuratively, they're going down. So, with that happy thought, I shall leave you. Less than 24 hours after recording this video, Rick headed out to meet Sue Cowton. Earlier in this episode, we spoke of one of Rick's nannies that he had as a child. Now, Sue Cowton, she was one of Karen's closest confidants. As we previously said, she had changed her name to Angela Marilyn Smith in the mid-90s. She was one of several of Berg's lovers who molested Rick, and she appears frequently in pictures throughout the book. Ricky has arranged to meet Angela. His ultimate goal is to torture Angela for information on the whereabouts of his mother and the inner circle of the family. Here's a clip where he discusses the various torture methods he has in mind for Angela. I'm one person. I'm working under uh, conditions that aren't that great right now because I'll only have a small window of opportunity to uh, get the information that I need out of this person. I'm not trained in torture methods. Which is what I'm gonna have to make do. I got my drill here. The reason why it's got this fucking padding on it is just to try to silence it a bit because I'm in an apartment. Um, I got gags, fucking socks. <laughs> I got lots of fucking duct tape. Um, I got a soldering iron. Heat. Rather crude implement. I think can work wonders, especially if it's used in the right way. I'm not trained. I don't know how to fucking do this. I don't want to fucking do this. God damn it. January 8th, 2004. After meeting up with Angela, Rick brings her back to his apartment where he kills Angela Smith in Tucson, Arizona. Her throat had been slashed. She had several defensive wounds on her arms. In the crime scene photos, we see a bloody knife a bloody light switch, and Angela Smith in a pool of blood in an otherwise neat and tidy one-bedroom apartment. Although Ricky talks about torturing her in the video, there's no apparent signs of any torture having occurred. After slashing Angela's throat, he calls his wife. 
telling her multiple times that when he would end the call, it would be the last time she'd ever hear his voice. Alicia states that he said the hardest thing about killing Angela was that as she lay dying, she still didn't understand what she had done wrong. In the video, Ricky talks about how before he would kill himself, he would rent a nice hotel room, take a nice bath, and have a couple beers and, and maybe rent a prostitute, as he says. So he does this. He goes out and he, you know, he's driving around forever. And eventually he finds a nice hotel that he wants to stay at and he rents a room. After he arrived at the hotel, he cleaned up, took a shower, polished off a couple beers and watched a bit of television. At a certain point in the night, he decided to get his loaded gun and head to his car. Driving a block away from the hotel, Ricky pulls over into an abandoned parking lot. January 9th, 2004, Ricky Rodriguez, just 29 years old, pulls the trigger, leaving his body in a car on the side of the highway, hoping ending his life would also put an end to the future of the family. And so it is that the children of God, the Family International, have once again taken another young life. If you've been following the series so far, you'll see this long procession of name changes throughout the cult's history. And once again, in 2004, the cult changed their name to the Family International. Karen, Queen Prophetess Mama Maria Zerbi, married Stephen King Peter Amsterdam Kelly, and together they are the face of the Family International. Recent teachings of TFI are of angels and departed believers, the law of love, which we talked about in episode 12, and bridal theology, which we talked about again, we talked about in episode 15. They also talk of a spiritual warfare. And now this, this, is, a, this is a quote straight off of their website. We believe that there is a spiritual realm unseen in the physical world inhabited by God and his angels and spirits, as well as Satan, the foe of all righteousness. Satan and his evil spirits are in rebellion against God and are instigators of much of the evil and suffering that have afflicted humankind throughout the ages. We believe that a relentless warfare is being waged in this spiritual realm between good and evil, between God and his good forces, and Satan and his evil forces, with each seeking to influence the souls and minds of humankind and the course of history. We believe that Christians can play a role in the spiritual warfare through their godly choices and actions that serve to further God's kingdom. Some people, however, through their ungodly actions, further the efforts of the forces of evil to suppress faith and goodness. The TFI also talk about sexual relations, stating, It is our belief that heterosexual relations, when practiced as God ordained and intended between consenting adults, are a pure and natural wonder of God's creation and permissible according to Scripture. So here they don't explicitly say between married couples. So I still believe wife swapping is still a thing, right? And, you know, honestly, I still think that children are not safe, even if, even if they, they do have these stricter adult-child sexual relationship practices being banned, right? They do have stricter rules and laws implemented within the cult. It's still not a safe environment for children. There's a section under their beliefs on their website. It's called The Sanctity of Life which basically states that they still believe life and death should be left to God. And as we heard in earlier episodes, many people have died because they believed taking medicine to be contradictory to the beliefs of the cult and to be contradictory to their faith in God. In the first two episodes in our series, we discuss Berg's belief in the end time, that a biblical apocalypse was upon us. The Family International still holds those same values. Again, this is a quote directly from their website. We believe that the scriptures foretelling the future of the world will be fulfilled, 
as many other biblical predictions have been fulfilled throughout the centuries. It is our belief that we are now living in the period of time known in the Bible as, quote, the last days. The last days refers to the era preceding the return of Jesus Christ. His return to earth will usher in a new millennium of peace, cessation of war and violence, and justice and equity for all mankind. We're going from 1968 when the cult was formed, when Berg started these end-time prophecies. We've seen them talk about the end-time apocalyptic, you know, here's the date it's going to end, multiple times, and Berg just keeps changing the date. From 1968 until 2021, we are still on the same page that the apocalypse is coming. How fucking long ago is that, man? That's like, like 50 fucking years, right? That's ridiculous. Now, if you're looking at this and you're saying, yeah, this is the, David Berg is right, this is the end time apocalypse, Karen Zerby's right, this is the end times, right? 50 years? He said that the end was going to come in like, like the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s. It's 2021. Where is this fucking end time? Like, yeah, it's shitty out here and everyone's fighting and people hate each other, but like, yo, come the fuck on, man. Where is this end time? Like, what the fuck? It's been 50 fucking years and you guys are still talking about the same shit? Now, you know, the the Family International is still operating today. There have been discussions about the followers having poor quality of life in other countries, such as Bangladesh. There's, like, a lot of case studies about how the Family International is still influenced by the history of the children of God. And, you know, there have still been several cases of family members or ex-family members being charged with sexual assault, including Alexander Watt with the 2018 conviction, and more recently, Derek Lincoln with the 2020 conviction, both on sex charges. So, you know, we can look at the children of God as a separate cult. We can look at the Family International as a separate cult, that they're two different things, but they're not. They're really not. They're one and the same. And the only difference is that David Berg is not alive, number one, and he's not the one leading it. Karen Zervi and and Stephen Kelly are. But number two, the only difference is that you guys uh, stopped openly fucking little children. I don't think that makes you a good person to just not have sex with children because you should just not be doing that in the first place. So my personal opinion is that the Family International is the same cult that the Children of God was. They are one and the same. And they're still operating today. And there's no accountability. You know, I mentioned that these two people have been charged recently, but, you know, you're, we're talking about thousands of members in this cult Maybe not all of them now, but at one point, the entirety of the cult was indoctrinated to believe that the best way to raise your children and to show love to your own family members was to fuck them. You know, you can't, you can't really separate yourself from that past, regardless of what you want to call yourself now. So that is our six-part series discussing David Berg, Karen Zerby, and the Children of God cult. The Family International is still in operation today. They're still active in many, many countries, and they still have thousands of members and communes and compounds all over the world. As we saw in the video where Ricky discussed how he wanted to get vengeance and justice for family members or ex-family members that were abused or are still being abused, You know, there's still that call. There's still that cry out for justice for these children. And, you know, we we saw that a lot of times people are, even if they're not sexually abused, even if they're not physically tortured, they're still separated from their family. And, you know, a lot of people are, are indoctrinated into the cult from birth. And we saw in episode, uh, 15? You know, whatever episode we talked about Vivian Shalander, she she was in the cult with her her family, and she had four children or five children, and she could only escape with one, the youngest one, the only one that she had, you know, readily available contact with. And 
you know, unfortunately, that's just how some people need to get out because she was able to go back and get her children out. And we talked about that in a previous episode. But, you know, so many of these children are moved around from compound to compound. And, you know, they're not they're not able to be children. They're not able to watch television or play video games or play with their friends or listen to secular music and just be kids. They have to perform constantly. And, you know, even if they've stopped this corporal punishment and all that sort of thing with the family, you know, um, in terms of not, you know, in terms of separating themselves from the children of God past, I'm sure that there are still a lot of things happening within the family that are, you know, uh, taboo, that, that would not be accepted in regular society. So there it is. There, there's six episodes on the history of the Children of God and the Family International. And unfortunately, Ricky's call for vengeance and justice went unanswered. He, 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 you know, he said in the video, I'll at least get to take one person out with me. And that's what he did. And he was hoping that when you know, he ended his life, that that would end the cult. And unfortunately, the cult has still been going on for you know, almost 20 years after his death. Hopefully, at one point, I can do an episode where we talk about the downfall of Karen Zerbe or the destruction and the abolition of the Children of God and the Family International. But as of this episode, as of 2021, they're still in operation today. Thank you so much for joining me on this wild ride throughout history. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into the Children of God and the Family International Cult. This episode is produced by Death Hotel Creative, hosted by myself, Dr. Mystery. To view more and to grab your exclusive Cabinet of Mystery merch, visit us at notwhatwesay.com, check out our Instagram handle at Cabinet of Mystery, or our Twitter at Open the Cabinet. Please leave us a review if you enjoyed the show and let us know what topics you'd like to hear in the future. You can hit us up either on the socials or at cabinetofmystery at gmail.com. If you'd like to leave us a voice message and appear in upcoming episodes, you can leave us a voicemail at anchor.fm slash cabinetofmystery. Thank you so much for listening and please subscribe or follow for more episodes. Okay, well, keep keep fighting, keep the faith, and all that other stuff. And someday, in some way, some of us are going to be around to see those fuckers burn, literally or figuratively. They're going down. So, with that happy thought, I shall leave.